Hello again, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us for this Friday's edition of Alaska Weather on the 29th day of October now, 2021. I'm Dave Percy, a meteorologist with the National Weather Service, and I'll be hosting today's show. Up first, we've got on hazardous weather graphics, we got uh, quite a illuminated area here. Uh, high wind warning out for the uh, uh, let's see, Turnigan Arm and the Anchorage Hillside, that's out from about midnight tonight until, uh, or through Sunday, or through Saturday, I'm sorry, midnight tonight through Saturday night, actually into uh, possibly early Sunday, and that's for winds gusting from the east, east southeast up to 90 miles an hour possibly, and uh, high wind warning also for the Alaska Range into the Cuscombe, northern Cuscombe Valley. And that's for 80 mile an hour wind gusts there, and that's uh, out for uh, midnight tonight through midnight uh, or through Sunday for the entire Alaska Range. They're looking for winds gusting from the south to 80 miles per hour. And then there's a winter storm warning out for the uh, McGrath area there. The or I'm sorry, not not McGrath, the Grayling uh, Russian Mission. Uh, flat in those areas, Holy Cross, the lower Yukon River Valley, for example, or in other words, and that's for, let's see, 8 to 10 inches of snow possible, uh, again, uh, for the day tomorrow through tomorrow night and into Sunday, and uh, then there's winter weather advisories out for tonight for Bristol Bay, 5 to 10 inches of snow possible, winds gusting 50 miles an hour, creating uh, low visibilities and blowing snow. And then also winter weather advisory out for the uh, Galena area. And then winter storm warnings out for Eastern Norton Sound and up in the Kobuk Valley around Gamble. Around Gamble. I'm sorry, around uh, up in the Kobuk Valley around Ambler. There's nothing out for uh, Gamble at all. And moving on to the satellite imagery. You can see uh, moisture streaming northward through the interior. That brought some air, quite a widespread area of light snow and snow showers uh, to the interior up here, uh, pretty light amounts, although Bettles, Koyukuk Valley, and Coldfoot picked about an inch or so of snow. Other areas had less than that, uh, so it was uh, light snow going on, but uh, looked like a little convective here right in this area northwest of Fairbanks. They may have had more snow than that, although it was over a, kind of a small area. Otherwise, uh, light snow flurries continue out here over the Seward Peninsula and along the northwest coast, but again, mounts are quite light, low pressure persisting there. See just a weak cyclonic curvature of the clouds there, more moisture coming out of the Russian Far East. Big storm coming northward, bringing heavy wind, rain, and snow in toward Kodiak Island this afternoon. Mixed rain and snow earlier today there, winds gusting 40 to 45 miles an hour. Really strong northerlies have developed over the eastern Aleutians, gusting uh, 50 to 60 miles an hour at uh, places like uh, Nikolsky on Alaska had peak wind gusts 60 miles an hour, Cold Bay, Alaska Peninsula seeing gusts uh, 45 to 55 miles an hour this afternoon. Winds on the increase 40, 45 miles an hour, Kodiak with uh, again rain and snow. It should change over to just all rain, especially uh, areas below probably 500 feet. If not currently, it will in the next uh, hour or so. And mid and high level clouds on the increase here after the snows ended earlier today over the uh, northern Cook Inlet area and into the Manuska Valley. That's pretty much tapered off and uh, about finished now. Head up to uh, several inches up in the Eagle River area, kind of one of the heavier uh, snowfall amounts. Otherwise, that's over and uh, the breaks over as well as thickening clouds move into southern Alaska. Showers over the panhandle on the decrease, and that's about ready to end. You can see early on especially, but that's starting to end now. A couple of bands of uh, moisture of cloudiness actually off the coast there. And then back to the west, not much going on. You can see the Sierra Shield there, mostly shifting off to the southeast. So uh, Bering Sea and Aleutians is not looking too bad today. And on the chart, there's a very tight gradient ahead of this northward, slowly northward moving 973 millibar low, bringing the strong winds of the eastern Aleutians. And along the Alaska Peninsula with uh, increasing wind, Kodiak Island into southern uh, Cook Inlet, or actually more like the Barren Islands. And then this very weak front out here to the west, uh, not much of a factor at all. 
Moving on to the forecast for tonight. Again, uh, heavy wind and rain. Kodiak Island increasing across all of the western North Gulf Coast, Kenai Peninsula, Southern Cook Inlet. Snow and blowing snow there on the east side of that warm front, especially from the Brooks Range, or I'm sorry, the Alaska Range into the Cuscombe Valley down across Bristol Bay with the winter weather advisories out for tonight. And snow will be on the increase for the Cuscombe Valley as well, kind of banking up uh, along the Alaska range there, so don't look for too much uh, north or west of the range tonight. Just variably cloudy skies, uh, temperatures, uh, some areas falling below zero. And showers of rain and snow continue there along the southeast coast, uh, again, slowly diminishing, and that should give way to a partly sunny day tomorrow. So a risk of a shower up there around Elfin Cove, uh, Icy Bay, Chance of rain, Yakutat, heavy wind and rain. Again, wind gusts in the uh, mountain passes, south central Alaska, 80 to 90 miles per hour. High wind warnings out. Winter weather advisories or warnings or watches there in the precipitation area to the west there along that trough axis in the western interior. But dry along the coast, Aleutians, partly sunny, light winds. Uh, same for the Perloffs, maybe a snow shower or two for the eastern Aleutians, but winds will be diminishing there, but strong winds for the Alaska Peninsula and for the day on Sunday. Not too bad over the panhandle. Looks like mostly sunny skies, winds uh, fairly light. Maybe uh, marine areas looking at 20 knot winds from the south or southeast, but temperatures will be mild. And uh, eastern and northeast interior looks uh, warmer and drier with uh, clearing. So pretty good weekend coming up there with the moisture, that whole system now weakening, still windy. Still quite windy over south central Alaska, but they'll be diminishing, especially as that low center tracks northward. The whole pattern weakening, rain heavy becomes just moderate and a little more isolated right along the south coast of the Kenai Peninsula into western Prince William Sound. Little, if any, getting uh, into the northern Cook Inlet area. And then the next system spreads some rain into the western Aleutians as the main low center stays back over the western Bering Sea. But the warm front may spread some rain into the Pribilof Islands. Looks pretty snowy for the Seward Peninsula up along the northwest coast. And milder temperatures mix the snow with rain, especially towards sea level or at the surface there for the uh, western interior. And for the lows tonight in the 30s for the Panhandle, uh, single numbers to and teens, South Central Alaska, especially the Cuscomb Valley, but tending to warm up over the uh, Kenai Peninsula. Lows occurring during the evening hours and then warming as the clouds and wind increase. And the highs, 40s for Kodiak Island, 40s for the Panhandle, 30 to 40 elsewhere, but 20s west of the Alaska Range. Lows, teens to mid 20s for the areas west of the Alaska Range. And then highs into the lower 40s. And for the uh, Arctic coast, looking at single numbers and teens for the lows tonight, down around zero in some places, highs uh, 15 to 20 for the Arctic coast and the North Slope in the 20s for the interior, followed by lows in the teens and highs back into the uh, lower to mid 40s for the uh, central and eastern Tanana Valley. And uh, 15 to 25 for the North Slope of the Arctic coast, near 30 out toward the Bering Strait. And out southwest, uh, kind of chilly lows near freezing for the Pribilofs in the 30s for the Aleutians, followed by highs, lower 40s. And lower to mid 40s there for the central Aleutians. And for the lows the following morning, us uh, pretty much in the uh, 20s, lower 20s along the coast, mid 20s for the Pribilofs, and then the 30s everywhere else, and then highs in the upper 30s to and now, aviation weather around Alaska. And moving on to aviation weather now, I'm meteorologist Carrie Hazley, starting off with a look at flying weather conditions across the state of Alaska for Saturday morning. Low pressure dominates the weather, of course, across mainland Alaska with that area moving up towards the state from the south. IFR conditions across most of southern mainland Alaska, including the Bristol Bay Area, the Alaska Peninsula, Kodiak Island, and then also the southern and eastern Kenai Peninsula is Prince William Sound IFR tomorrow morning as well. IFR conditions to start off tomorrow morning over the Fort Yukon area. We'll see some gradual improvement though in that area as we get into the afternoon hours on Saturday. We do see some IFR conditions work their way into the western part of the interior. Some of that stretches around towards the Brooks Range too. We'll see that impacting some of our passes. Now in the southern part of the state, IFR conditions definitely persist with that area of low pressure. Over our Bristol Bay, Kodiak, and then parts of the uh, eastern and southern Kenai Peninsula. Looking for some downslope conditions through the Anchorage Bowl to keep the Matanuska-Susitna Valley in the Anchorage area, primarily VFR tomorrow. 
Now into Sunday morning, we do see more in the way of precipitation working its way into south central, uh, at least in the downslope areas. We'll see uh, visibility drop and the ceilings also drop around the uh, Matanuska, Susitna Valley and Anchorage. Marginal VFR conditions there and IFR widespread out across the eastern Kenai Peninsula, out along the Prince William Sound area and then stretching all along the western part of mainland Alaska. Also looking for some IFR conditions Sunday morning up along the Arctic coast. Now into the Sunday afternoon time frame, improvement up along the Arctic, some IFR lingering though along the Brooks Range. And then in the southern part of the state, we continue to see IFR dominate the weather across uh, most of the southern part of the Cook Inlet, eastern Kenai Peninsula, and then parts of Prince William Sound, also Kodiak Island likely to be primarily IFR for Sunday afternoon. Now for a look at our past conditions going into the day tomorrow, Anatovic and Adigan likely to start the day marginal VFR at both passes. Anatovic though is going to be a bit closer to where some of the snow creeps its way into uh, the northern part of the state. So that could drop Anatovic down to IFR, not looking for that snow to make its way into Adigan tomorrow. Now down around uh, the Alaska Range passes, Merrill, you're going to be uh, IFR in snow tomorrow. Lake Clark also IFR, but in rain there. Further up along the Alaska Range, Rainy Pass, IFR tomorrow with snow. Windy Pass, some snow showers likely to work their way into that area. We'll keep the pass around marginal VFR, not expecting it to drop quite as low as some of the other Alaska Range passes. And as we work our way further east along the Alaska Range, Isabel, you're going to start out marginal VFR. You actually should improve later in the day. Mukatha are working your way up to VFR. Metasta Pass, VFR for the day on Saturday. Now, uh, moving down to Tanita, marginal VFR, some snow showers in there, and Portage Pass, IFR with rain down around the Panhandle, Chukut and uh, White starting their day off with maybe some uh, scattered snow showers in the area, marginal VFR conditions, but improvement to VFR. Freezing levels, we do keep the surface line right across the southern part of mainland Alaska, and we're going to see uh, freezing levels around the Panhandle up to about 2,000 feet. Icing going to be kind of the story tomorrow around south central Alaska. We're going to look for some ice below about 15,000 feet across the southwestern part of mainland. Over towards south central, we're going to look for icing below about 18,000 feet up to about moderate ice, but widespread isolated moderate tomorrow with so much precipitation and moisture just getting pushed into the area with that area of low pressure dominating our weather. On to wind, the jet stream coming straight at us from the south. This is sometimes what we actually refer to as an atmospheric river. So we've got the jet stream pushing its way straight into the southern part of mainland Alaska for the day on Saturday. Fairly strong, winds up to about 120 knots, but the big story with this is just how much moisture it's actually bringing with it, which is why we've talked so much about precipitation, lower flight conditions, and other concerns so far. We also see the jet up along the Arctic coast there, up to about 100 knots for the wind, and another jet out over the bearing, also up to about 100 knots. Now let's drop down, talk about the wind when we get down to our lower levels. So Saturday afternoon, 9,000 feet winds between 60 and 85 knots over a good portion of southern mainland Alaska with kind of a mid-level jet pushing um, both moisture and then strong wind into the southern part of mainland Alaska. Dropping down to 3,000 feet now, we're going to look for winds around south central at 3,000 feet to be up as high as 75 knots sustained. And then down over the uh, Gulf of Alaska up to about 65 knots and a very wide area there where we're looking for those very gusty winds. Dropping down to the surface now, you see a lot of purple on this map here. Those are going to be surface winds Saturday afternoon in excess of about 45 knots sustained. So let's take a closer look at uh, South Central Alaska, all of this purple gusty winds up to about 45 to 60 knots sustained, especially in the Anchorage area. And that's going to translate to turbulence across most of mainland Alaska, including some isolated severe over the Eastern Kenai, possibly uh, Kodiak Island. Leatherbacks are the largest turtles on Earth, growing up to seven feet long and weighing more than 2,000 pounds. These sea turtles are among the most highly migratory animals on Earth, some traveling up to 10,000 miles a year between their nesting and feeding grounds. Prevalent in every ocean except the Arctic and Antarctic, the species overall is declining, more so in the Pacific. In the Eastern Pacific, the Mexican population was once thought to be the largest in the world and has experienced an alarming decline. This trajectory of decline that we've seen and actually collapse, we're talking about only 20 or 30 turtles nesting every year where thousands used to just 40 years ago. That's the kind of dramatic decline. 
The Western Pacific population has been declining steadily and it's particularly critical to act now before it collapses while there are enough turtles and nests to respond to conservation measures. But threats to all leatherbacks in the Pacific need to be addressed. The top threats to populations are uncontrolled coastal development, all the bad stuff on the nesting beaches, egg harvest, poaching of the females, predation on the eggs by dogs and pigs. Deforestation makes the sand too warm and dry for the, and the eggs don't hatch. Another one is incidental capture in fishing gear. During their vast migrations, they get caught in fishing gear throughout the Pacific. And finally, marine debris, which the leatherbacks mistake for their favorite food, jellyfish, and they choke on those. Protecting leatherbacks in U.S. waters alone is not enough to ensure the continued existence of the species. The highly migratory nature of Pacific leatherbacks requires cooperation and international collaboration. NOAA is focusing on partnerships with Mexico, Central America, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and the Solomon Islands in the Pacific. Our action plan promotes a holistic recovery strategy that addresses all the sources of mortality. So that's basically ensuring that the remaining nesting sites are protected and the nests produce as many hatchlings as possible. And then secondly, in tandem with that is reducing the fisheries related mortalities. We're working with international partners to incentivize co community participation on the nesting beach conservation and developing alternative livelihood programs that wean communities off leatherback resources and introduce alternative methods for food and income. Recovery is going to take a long time, on the order of 20 to 30 years at least before we see some of these actions bear fruit. But here in the U.S., we can all help leatherbacks by making seafood choices, for instance, that support sustainable fishing practices. And beachgoers can certainly do their part by keeping our oceans clean of plastic debris, picking up marine litter, particularly plastic bags. Together with our partners, we are strengthening protection and conservation efforts to ensure a future for leatherbacks, helping them to survive and once again thrive in the waters of the Pacific Ocean. For over 40 years, NOAA scientists have been collecting data and piecing together the story of the gray whale. Each year, new discoveries are made, revealing the secrets of this ancient traveler. With the Northeastern Pacific population recovered, leading scientists from the NOAA Southwest Fisheries Science Center continue their research efforts to help save the Western population from extinction. The most effective way to identify individuals and count the population is to photograph them from the surface. Using the gray whale's distinctive markings and gray spots caused by parasites on their skin, scientists document these characteristics to identify individuals. So we're able to track migratory pathways and corridors by the simple use of photo identification. There are other ways to do that as well, biopsy sampling and genetics. And from the air. Aerial photography is one way you can study animals based on their size and shape. So you can learn a lot about nutritive and reproductive condition of whales just by measuring their size and shape from vertical aerial photographs. You can also put satellite transmitters on them and track them remotely. You put the transmitter on and let them go and you watch them move across the Pacific or down to China or wherever it might be. To further learn and discover where these great sojourners swim, the team of researchers traveled to Russia and set up camp on Sakhalin Island. 
The main focus of our research uh, while we were on Sockland was to collect photo identification. If it was a whale that we had not collected a genetic sample from previously, we would also attempt to collect a sample from the whales. Whereas whales are endowed with natural insulation, their human observers must gear up to brave the cold in order to study these marine giants up close. We're typically only able to work about one third of the time that we're there, and that's mostly due to this fog that just invades the area and sits sometimes for weeks on end. So it can be very challenging to try and do field work in this site. Recently, two whales from the western population surprised scientists by migrating across the Pacific to the waters of California and Mexico. It's a really fun finding. It's added another piece to the puzzle that we didn't previously know about. And I would have to say that it's opened up more questions than we had before. Research scientists from Japan, Russia, and the United States share images of animals they've spotted. We take a photograph of an individual off of Sakhalin Island, and we get a phone call from Japanese scientists, and they say, hey, guess what? We've got a picture of a gray whale in Japan. We say, hey, can you send it to us? We'd love to try and match it. They'll send us the picture, we'll compare it to our catalog, and they'll say, hey, we've got a match from Sakhalin to Japan. Unlike many species of whales that still remain on the endangered species list, the Eastern Pacific gray whale, once on the brink of extinction, now numbers about 20,000 individuals. Recovery efforts that started 40 years ago and the ongoing research and monitoring by NOAA scientists have contributed to the conservation of the gray whales. Together with legal protection and public education, scientists are playing their part to ensure the survival of this magnificent migratory animal. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Welcome back. Winds today along the outer coastline of the Panhandle or from the southwest on the south coast at 20 to 25 knots. South to southeast winds were observed uh, on the north coast at 20, to, at 20 knots with 7 to 10 foot seas. Inside waters, winds are mostly southerly in all areas at about 20 knots, give or take. Seas running 4 feet to as high as 6 feet in Clarence Strait. <clears throat> and then the outlook uh, forecast for Saturday for the Panhandle outer coastline, small craft advisories on the north coast, 25 knots, uh, 25 to 30 knots from the southeast, and 20 to 25 knots on the south coast. Central southern inside waters, southeast winds 15 knots, and for Lynn Canal, northerly is at 15. <clears throat> and for Friday, today, Cook Inlet saw northeasterlies increasing to small craft advisory levels, size 30 knots south of the Forelands. Good gales into the Barren Islands, Kamishak Bay, east at 45 knots. Minimum gales for the western North Gulf Coast coming up this afternoon, east 35 knots. Prince Liam Sound, east winds uh, coming up uh, to 20 knots and southeast to 30 knots from Middleton Island. <clears throat> Forecast for Saturday. Look for 40 knot easterly winds, Prince William Sound tomorrow with 9 foot seas and 40 knot easterlies also for Southern Cook Inlet seas at around 10 feet. Otherwise good gales from the North Gulf Coast, 40 to 45 knots out of the southeast and southeast 45 knots for the Barren Islands with seas at about 26 feet. And moving on to Kodiak Island today, those winds of course came up uh, 40 to 45 knots as forecasted and storm warnings occurred on the Bering or the Pacific side of the Alaska Peninsula, northeast of 50 knots with seas just under 20 feet. Otherwise, gale warnings for northeast winds 35 to 40 knots from Bristol Bay down the coastline there to Cape Sarachev. And for Saturday, those winds will be more northerly, but gales continue for the Alaska Peninsula as high as 45 knots sustained on the Pacific side of the peninsula, 40 knots Bering Sea side. Bristol Bay, small craft advisories northeast at 30 knots, Kodiak Island, 45 knots, southeast winds on the eastern side of the island, otherwise minimum gales from the east for Shelikoff Strait. <clears throat> Fox Island today had uh, pretty gusty winds as high as 60 miles an hour at uh, Dutch Harbor on Alaska. And uh, lighter winds as you head west over the Aleutians, Zadak and Atka about 30 knots from the north, and then uh, lighter and more variable out west. For tonight, uh, <clears throat> 
or for, I'm sorry, for Saturday for the Unalaska Island area, northwest 35 to 40 knots, Mac Island north to northwest 20 to 30 knots, and uh, 15 to 20 knot winds for the central Aleutians. Southwest coast, north winds today, 20 to 30 knots. Small craft advisories for the Pribloffs, 25 knots. Otherwise, lighter winds over the northern Bering Sea. Northwest to 20 for St. Lawrence Island and about 15 knots for St. Matthew Island. Saturday, northerly winds increased to 40 knots there south of uh, Nunavak Island. Otherwise, the Pribloffs just west at 15, south 25 for St. Matthew Island. And northerly is 15 to 20 knots. Uh, in the case of Norton Sound, call it north at 15 seas, two feet. 20 knots from the north for St. Lawrence Island with four foot seas. Arctic coast today, light winds on the east side and small craft advisories occurred from Wales to Cape Beaufort for Saturday. Winds will be lighter and northerly, north to northeast uh, from Wales up to Cape Beaufort at 15 knots. Otherwise, the remainder of the coastline will be mostly easterly at about 15 knots with seas in the ice-free waters running at about three feet. And looking at the forecast for tonight, again, not bad for the Aleutians and Bering Sea. Big storm south of the, uh, Kodiak, the center well south, but the frontal boundary pushing northward with heavy wind and rain and snow. There, west of the warm front, it'll be snow and blowing snow. Winter weather advisory, Bristol Bay, increasing snow, Cuscombe Valley. And uh, <clears throat> winds gusting to 50 miles an hour reduce visibility there, especially in Bristol Bay. And high wind warning kicks in after midnight for... Uh, East Anchorage, turn and Gnarm, Anchorage Hillside, uh, all the way to Portage for gusts 80 to 90 miles per hour. That continues through the day tomorrow. That low center edge is northward, a little bit deeper now, under 970 millibar. Stays uh, very windy with rain heavy at times along the coast into Southern Cook Inlet and the upslope areas of the Western Alaska Range with moderate amounts of snow. Winter weather advisory for the Lower Yukon Valley to look for eight to 10 inches of snow and that tapers off as you head north. Otherwise, Eastern Interior, Copper River Basin, windy, warmer and dry and mostly sunny for the Panhandle on Sunday with uh, light winds and warm temperatures and rain continues, but both the wind and rain in a diminishing mode across southern Alaska as that whole system begins to weaken. Next front pushes into the western Bering and Aleutians with a little bit of increase in the wind and rain out that way with warm front rains reaching the perb loss maybe late in the night. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.